Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com and I'm here to do another random artist feature today and uh, it's about Cloud Cult, Minnesota band who's been around for uh, in effect almost 20 years. Um, try to give this my backstory as briefly as possible. My earliest recollection of Cloud Cult from memory is I list, used to listen to Radio K here and there uh, in the early part of the of the 2000s, uh, Radio K being 770 AM KUM, it's the University of Minnesota's radio station. Anyway, they were played on there quite a bit, and I I don't know, I'd hear a song, and a lot of the artists they played on there I didn't care for. Once in a while they'd play something I liked. I, they would never play a lot of prog, Dream Theater, Porcupine Tree, or whatever. But uh, once in a while they'd play, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example. They played the Mars Volta at one point. So, anyway, and I never really thought much of them. I, I just thought that they were just a local band that the local Minnesota hipsters loved and everything like that. And Anyway, finally in 2008, I started hearing some music from a band on there I liked. I think it was, and it happened to be Cloud Cult. I think it was um, every, everybody, Everyone is a Cloud or whatever. A song from their 2008 album, uh, Feel Good Ghosts. And suddenly I realized their music was a lot more interesting, a lot more layered and whatever, progressive, than I realized. And so that sort of got me to finally check them out, and I became a fan. So I'm just going to talk about the, their, their history, though. I've been listening to their their whole catalog as much as I can over the last couple weeks, ever since they just put out a new album called The Seeker through a Pledge Music campaign. And it's coinciding with a film, an all music soundtrack film no dialogue actually is heard in it but uh um and i was absolutely floored by it and it kind of got me re-energized and even reassessed my interest in them even more than it has in a few years and probably at any point so um so anyway but going back to the beginning of their history they craig minua he was known as craig richardson i guess but uh, craig minua and his, he eventually married a woman named connie uh, and they changed their name to Minowa, I guess. But uh, Craig event started the project out called the Shade Project or whatever, his own music. And that's what it was. It was like a, a solo individual project that he did like in a bedroom, in his bedroom in a closet, I guess. And it was a lot of rough recording samples and stuff like that. But I'd never actually heard it until this past week. I'd, I'd never done the full research per se. But anyway, some good stuff on there, um, demos and stuff like that. Later they were release, which I might be able to talk about on a collection on a CD. But um, definitely was kind of out there, experimental, you know. But anyway, that was in the mid-90s, like 94, 95. Um, and then uh, later he just kind of tried to play it live. And, you know, there's a documentary release that explains that. But so... They were known as Cloud Cult at that point. I mean, it was the Shade Project. I don't know if it was released under Cloud Cult, but anyway, they, he finally changed the name of his music, main music project, to Cloud Cult, and then their debut album, or the, the first album they released as that name, I believe, was called Who Killed Puck. And I'll admit that this is another album that I haven't listened to to large degrees. I actually thought I had it, and I didn't. I probably just downloaded it at one point when I first got in really into them in the late 2000s, but... Having listened to this a couple of times now, there's some really good music on here. It's still kind of in the very experimental, sampling, uh, textured, sort of uh, somewhat bedroom recording kind of stuff, but it's a little more polished than, say, the Shade Project stuff. I guess as far as favorites on this record, this came out in, this says 2001, but I'm thinking actually it was 2000. Cause it listed, it's listed as 2000. Maybe it was like originally released and distributed on 2000, in 2000 and then got more full distribution in 2001. But again, I guess this is a concept album. Uh, where it starts, the first track, if you look at the track list, probably is my favorite song on this whole record. But there's a lot of stuff on here that kind of, there's little moments you enjoy. But where it starts has this part where it's talk, the main chorus or whatever is talking about I found God in this, I found God in that. It was one line, I found God in Steve Miller. Uh, I lo really love your peaches, you know, quoting, uh, what's the Steve Miller song? Not the Joker, but um, let me shake your tree. Um, anyway, yeah, and I guess this is, uh, among the, all the early records, I guess, I might say this is my favorite at this point. I mean, I guess I, I'll tell you this right now. My, my interest in Cloud Cult is really with their more recent music of the last 10 years or so. 
and then the older albums are are sort of a work in progress but i don't know if i'll ever grow to love them like i've grown to love the more recent stuff so but then uh well this is the basis of a lot of their music since that point that was in 2000 or 2001 Craig Minua and Connie Minua had a baby and named Caden, and unfortunately, this child, as you learn, there's a documentary they put out, and it's been talked about almost ad nauseum <laughs> uh, about their history. He he died after about two years. I think it might have been like uh, Sid, sudden infant death syndrome. I'm not sure how he he passed away, but he just died in his sleep when he was two, and really had a profound impact on him and uh, and the music actually. So every album after that basically has had the Cloud Cult symbol like signature symbol and it also has had a lot of references and samples of his voice and stuff like that um, which is really a, a unique and unusual approach um, I mean I, I can't really relate to experience but anyone who has a child and then they end up losing that child has got to be traumatic and so they kind of use the music of Cloud Cult to kind of sort of allow him to sort of feel like he's still living uh, he's still around, basically to allow his presence to be felt still. But so this album, "They Live on the Sun," came out in 2002 after he had died. Of course, it's like basically dedicated to him. Um, and I would say at this point, I'm the least familiar with this album among all the Cloud Code albums, even though I have it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of kind of yeah, you know, angsty kind of upset sad stuff in here of course but it's sort of it's also kind of impacted that influences by some of the sort of cynical but also experimental stuff and um as far as as, as far as favorites would go on this record on the sun the, the the first song which is like an acoustic ballad that track i like um stupido uh man on the moon which is their kind of, of the belief that maybe he went to the moon um Toys in the Attic, you know. I, again, it's probably a record I could appreciate even more with time, but I mean, in order to like talk about the history of the band, I wasn't going to be able to listen to all these albums thoroughly to sort of like know them like the back of my hand. So, so then uh, the next year, I think it was 2003 or maybe it was 2004, they put out another record, Aurora Borealis, which again still had the influence of the loss of their son Caden, but. Um, they live in like very rural, like greater Minnesota, and it's kind of, you can see the stars really well, so that's kind of where the title came from. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, a, this is, I mean, I wouldn't call it space rock exactly, but um, it's definitely more, I would say more ambient. It has more textures, more kind of, uh, you know, exploratory kind of sides to it. Um, again, I mean, like, there's an acoustic album that just came out uh, a few years, a couple of years ago, and the first track, Breakfast with My Shadows, on there. Um, but my familiarity with all the songs on here is kind of limited, and you can see the the tracks are kind of written scattered there. They think they intentionally did that, but um, and they're all long. None of these tracks are just like one word. Princess Bride, Alone at a Party in a Ghost Town. Grappling Hook and Northern Lights, that's one that I, I, I know has been one they've played live, and it's a, sort of a favorite. Lights Inside My Head. But anyway, I would say this is kind of a, a continuation of They Live on the Sun to a point, but it's a little more refined musically. The other thing I should, probably should mention about Cloud Cult, they're, they have a label that Craig and his wife founded called Earthology Records, and they're very environmental. All their CDs, pretty much all of them are recycled. Um, they... There's a lot more to it. You can read about it online, but it's very, it's very original. It's a very unique approach to um, just releasing physical products. And in close the, cl included, they never put out vinyl until their, their new record, The Seeker, will be coming on vinyl, on recycled vinyl. But because uh, vinyl is not manufactured in an environmentally friendly way. So, but anyway, 2005, they released the, the follow-up to that. They released. Uh, duh, 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 advice from the happy hippopotamus and as in the documentary Craig talked about um, he'd had these dreams about this hippo talking to him so that's kinda where um, that came from the title came from the artwork is really really unique really uh, kind of creative I guess we do but with with the kid and like all the colors and the hippos and some other animals there's the hippo right there um, and Scott West who's on the, the documentary I'm referring to 
is a member of Cloud Cult, uh, a longtime friend of Craig's, I guess, um, and an artist who does artwork while they play live. That's kind of one of the unique thing about Cloud Cult is they play, they play their music live, and then they have both Connie Manua and Scott West doing artwork, doing paintings, uh, sort of influenced by what's going on with the music or what some other things. But it's that's why they're kind of a can't miss live band, who I've seen a, a, a few times at least. But as far as the advice from the Happy Hippopotamus goes, it's a long record. Like most of the records, most of these records are between 50, 45, 50 minutes and, and over an hour. And so, and especially like these early records, they're kind of scattered where those tracks you like and tracks are sort of experimental interludes. Um, but I think the Hippopotamus record was the first record from the early records that I sort of started to latch on to a few specific tracks, like Transistor Radio. That's kind of a, that might be one of their most well-known songs. He's talking, the lyrics talk about taking a trip and talking about his, his grandfather uh, leading him on a trip, kind of. Um, but uh, I guess among the other songs, uh, the Happy Hippo, that song, is noteworthy. Among things about it, it, it kind of references Neil Young's uh, Hey, Hey, My, My, um, which they even reference that in the the liner notes, well, sort of thanking Neil, Neil Young for not suing them or whatever. But um, Light at the End of the Tunnel, um, there's a bunch of other songs. Lucky Today, um, Washed Your Car, You Got Your Bones to Make a Beat. You know, there's what comes at the end. But it's a long record. I, that's what I remember when I first checked out this record and the early records is that they were long records and they weren't of the fidelity, I guess, or just the production values of some of the, the, re, the recent records that I got into from them. So, um, you know what? I think I'm going to stop now and make part two.